Thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Business of Fun podcast. I'm your host, Dave Wakeman. Today's episode is brought to you by my friends at Booking Protect, the global leaders in refund protection. Visit them at www.bookingprotect.com and find out how you can become a partner. Also, we're looking for ticket guides. You might ask me what a ticket guide is, and I want to tell you. The Ticket Guide is a new program that Booking Protect has created for people who love live events. So theater, concerts, sports, comedy, all kinds of stuff. And who are willing and able to share their experiences, their ideas, their thoughts on these events across social media. So we're doing an application. If you visit bookingprotect.com and search for ticket guide there's an application there i'm also going to include the link in the show notes and i'm going to share it out on social media so you can have an opportunity to become a ticket guide maybe you can go to any kind of crazy venue all over the world right um simon and i were at the sydney opera house earlier late last year um Maybe you get a chance to go visit my friends in Boston at the Fenway Park. Uh, maybe maybe you're a baseball fan. You can tell us about the Yankee Stadium or, or Wrigley Field, right? Um, we're going to try to do some send people the experiences all over the world, um, become a ticket guide, share your ideas with so on social media. It's going to be fun. It's going to be great. There's an application at bookingprotect.com, and I'm going to share the link. It's going to be phenomenal. Also... Another place you'll find this link is in my newsletter. It's called Talking Tickets. It comes out every Friday. It's five top stories from the week with a quick analysis and some action items so that you can take advantage or take action on the trend or idea that is taking hold in the world of tickets. You can get that one of two ways. You can go to my website. That's DaveWakeman.com and click on the Talking Tickets link and it'll take you to the sign-up page. Or you can send me an email. It's my name, Dave at DaveWakeman.com with talking tickets in the subject line, and I will get you signed up. I'm going to post this episode today, which is Tuesday, March 10th, 2020. And on Thursday, March 12th, 2020, I am hosting a webinar on ways that primary market ticket sellers can maximize their relationship with the secondary market. I'm going to include the link to that in my uh, show notes, but if you want to get it, because it's a little tough for me to send that, to post the link, send me an email, davidavewakeman.com, put webinar, uh, secondary market in the subject line, and I will send you the link or I'll get you signed up. Uh, that'll be Thursday, the 12th of March at 12 p.m. Eastern time, and it'll be about using the secondary market successfully as a primary market seller. So get on that. My guest today is a big one. It's Don Vaccaro, CEO of Ticket Network. Uh, Don and I have been going back on doing this podcast since last year's Ticket Workshop in D.C. Uh, And after I saw Don speak in front of Congress about 10 days ago, I emailed him. I said, I thought he came across very well. And why don't we do a podcast? And Don said, yeah. He said, fine, let's do it. So we did it. Uh, This is a good one. I think there's a lot here that you're going to find um, interesting. We talk about data sharing. We talk about data transfer. We talk about um, creating a healthy ticket ecosystem. We talk about all-in pricing, uh, privacy. Um, We talk about legislation at the state level. We talk about tracking of your of consumers and tracking of data and using data in nefarious ways and positive ways we talk about um a little bit about pearl jam we talk about sports and entertainment uh we talk about some of the challenges that some of these legislative ideas or some of these um restrictions put on smaller artists um we talk about how to get involved in the discussion around um ticket legislation and you know, um, open and fair markets. We got into all kinds of crazy stuff. So without anything else from me, here's my conversation with Don Vaccaro on the Business Fun Podcast. I want to welcome Don Vaccaro to the Business of Fun Podcast. Don, how are you? I'm, I'm great, Dave. Yourself? Oh, man, I'm, I'm doing all right. This is, uh, this is very, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're on. This is going to be fun. I think people are going to dig our conversation. 
Excellent. Thank you for uh, having a podcast that address these issues. I think it's very helpful, not only for the industry, but for consumers as well. So go right ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I well, thank you because I try to um, I try to be fair and balanced, just like Fox News. Uh, I'm fair and balanced here. I try to, to you know just give people a little bit of information. But um, I wanted to talk to you because you know last week on Capitol Hill there was a ticket hearing, and you were one of the the people who had the uh, either the responsibility or you got you, you know unfortunately you were you were one of the people who had to go up there. Um, and I know some of the issues that were brought up are. are probably dear to both of us and things that we're both really focused on and trying to make sure that they come out and they don't harm consumers and they don't harm the ticket ecosystem. Uh, and specifically, I'm talking about uh, data sharing and transferability of tickets. And then overall, maybe creating a healthy ticket environment and ecosystem so consumers have access to tickets, people can buy tickets, sell tickets, whatever have you. Um, so I want to start out by asking you because um, – you know, from your point of view, sitting up there in front of Congress, you know, what were one or two of the big takeaways that you had from from your time on the Hill last week? Um, I, I guess the, the, the biggest takeaway is between Congress and between the FTC, uh, they want to see action taken uh, to make the experience for better for consumers uh, so that they don't have to act. So the business can basically self-regulate it, uh, self-regulate uh, themselves. Uh, I think uh, probably uh, a lot of folks don't realize that not only are the folks up there going to be affected by any legislation, but, you know, there's, there's a number of smaller primary ticketers that if they don't get out there and speak out, their voice is not going to be heard. Uh, as an example, in the FTC complaints, uh, there were a number of complaints from consumers who were buying movie tickets and didn't like the fact that the service fees were added on later. So you might expect this legislation to be a lot more encompassing than it is. That's, uh, that's one fact. Uh, the second thing is, uh, from what I heard from feedback, some legislators who were up there and watching it were very concerned that some of the folks there gave testimony that was outright false and misleading, you know, especially about uh, the data share that they share with people. There's a huge, onerous amount of data that folks are required to share, to go to a public event in a venue that's funded by taxpayer money. So I, you know, I think, and I've heard that now we have some folks in Congress who want to start investigating because of the practices of a large primary ticketer, how venues are funded and how those tickets are distribu distributed to the public and who has access to those big primary contracts because a lot of the venues are funded by local taxes. They're getting tax breaks. So I, I think this is going to grow rather than settle. And uh, I was quite surprised at the interest in folks about data sharing, tracking people's locations, tracking who they transfer tickets to, tracking and selling the sex of patrons or the change in sex of a patron are really onerous things for consumers um, who want to keep that privacy to themselves and not having to want to share it. Now, I'll give you an example. A uh, Fortune 50 company that spends well in excess of $10 million a year on professional sports tickets is reshifting their budget to other things because they don't want to use mobile ticketing, okay? Their devices that they have, uh, since they're a financial institution, uh, have to be approved by their IT staff, and the amount of information that they take from those devices is too much, so they won't allow the staff to do it. If you're in a merger or acquisition, you don't want that um, 
You don't want that uh, information to be disclosed, disclosed. You don't want that out there in the marketplace. And especially when you sell that data, there's a whole bunch of nefarious ways. Like some of the data includes your identity, the transaction, uh, your financial institution. Hold, hold on one second. Okay, uh, financial institution, the device that you're using, the location, your phone carrier, so they could sell that information to competing phone carriers, your private unlisted phone number can be shared, your biographical data, your racial and ethnic origin from one primary, your political opinions, your social media accounts, what you post, your religious beliefs, beliefs your age, gender, even your health issues. I don't even know if that's allowed uh, via HIPAA, but they want to share whether you buy a handicapped seat or not and that you're handicapped. So I think that that data is a huge issue for the legislator, and I think that that will be addressed because consumers don't need it. Consumers, if they're willing to share that and they want to share that for some purpose, by all means, they should be able to share that. But ticketing should be more more like a, the way you can buy an airplane ticket. You can have a hard ticket, you can have a mobile ticket, or you can have a PDF ticket. And that seems to work fine, giving consumers the choice. But if consumers have their choice, they'll buy a PDF ticket over a mobile ticket 90% of the time. Yeah, I have had conversations even today with some of these organizations, just like you talk about. And there are, con you know, these fi big financial firms mm -hmm. are concerned about the privacy of themselves, but also their customers. Um, I know from, you know, my wife being an attorney that there's also um, can open you up to legal challenges or legal issues. Like you can get your phone subpoenaed. I mean, there's like a lot of really scum. Scary things that could happen if you have, you know, all this data transfer. And one of the things during the hearing that kind of stretched the limits of my own, uh, uh, willingness to believe stuff or take things, you know, from the best possible light was the idea that, um, there was, n I, don't, I don't remember exactly how it was framed, but that, that there was no, uh, tracking going on with transfer of tickets, uh, especially when I pick up my phone and I know that, like, if I look in Facebook, which happens rare, you know, more and more rarely, They've tracked and are serving me ads for things that I might have mentioned as a joke in passing. Um, you know, so I find, you know, this data sharing thing is on a lot of consumers' mind. And I do think it's super, super important. It's just, um, but the idea that, oh, yeah, we're not doing anything and just trust us, that seems a little bit far-fetched to me. Right. And I think it's very clear on their terms and services pages that they had uh, to put up because of the California Consumer Privacy Act, that this is the data that they're not the sharing, they're really selling the data. And don't forget, when you get this much information about consumers, that data is worth a lot of money. And when you talk about well, billions of dollars, think, billions of dollars, the data is billions worth. of dollars. It, right, exactly. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, have, um, I have a friend who's involved in tech and he explained to me how, how much this data is worth now. Uh, and you know, it, it's indiscriminate the way that it's sometimes sold and diced up. So you, so it is, I'm sure that if people had a better understanding of what was actually going on with their data, they would be a little bit concerned. Yes. No, nope, I absolutely agree. Data, data is going to be a bigger and bigger concern, especially even if you look at some of the primary ticketers apps that track a consumer's location when the app is not even open. What's the need for that? I don't know. Okay, so there's a lot of information that they track there, and as much as they possibly can can track, and then then when they make an analysis. Uh, of who you're connected with, who your friends are, who your relatives are, who your business associates are. It gives competitors of yours a lot of information that they can market to since the data is for sale. Yeah, and you brought up a good point earlier that I think I should highlight because one of the things that's a theme that I come back to over and over again is, you know, especially around data because, you know, I have a – 
um, you know, an uncomfortable relationship with the amount of data sometimes. It, but a lot of times, if the best way to get somebody to share that data with you and help them to market to you is you ask them, but you trade some sort of value. And I think a lot of times what seems to come out, which goes back to your initial statement, is that instead of trusting the consumer or offering value, we're just trying to, not we, not you and I, but people are just trying to take the data and they're trying to like um, pull a fast one just so they can have access to it without ever exchanging any value for the consumer's data. But maybe I'm wrong. Right, and the data has the data has nothing nothing to do with the experience, or it has nothing to do with the venue and stuff like that. It's it's just it's just a monetization of data because you're forced to use an app in public venues to access an event that you're paying for, okay, that you're paying for not only by buying the ticket, but that you're paying for from the enormous tax breaks that venues get. And this is going to hurt venues as well. And this is not going to bleed out from the primaries because ultimately the venues are responsible in what they contract out. You know, another example would be is in New York, where there's um, a law about uh, service fees and rebates to venues that makes a lot of venues in New York ultimately on the hook for the high service fees that their uh, primary ticketers charge. And, you know, that is going up into hundreds of millions of dollars that those venues might have to disgorge and give back to consumers. In fact, New York, after hearing some of the stuff at that at the congressional hearing, has now scheduled a new uh, uh, an open public hearing on ticketing in New York in April to come to go through some of these concerns that the previous attorney general knew about but didn't act on. And I think the question is going to be: Well, if he knew about it and acted on, why? If he knew about it, why didn't he act on it? So there's a lot of folks in New York who are upset about the data share as well, and they're very upset about the, the ticket transferability. And, and, and you really have to give kadoos to the Buffalo Bills who said, look, you don't need to do mobile-only tickets. We're going to do other tickets because we're also concerned that folks with a lower income are going to have a harder time buying or tickets or reselling tickets because they might not have a compatible phone with the latest technology that these apps work on. Because don't remember, they only work on the latest phones. They don't work on the old phones. And that you have to speak English and agree to a huge contract before you sign on it. So, uh, you know, there's folks in the Hispanic community who are also upset about this as well. Yeah, that's and it's not just the Buffalo Bills. I mean, the Buffalo Bills is public, but there's other organizations that have told me, you know, that the nature of their fan base are, you know, maybe they're more seniors, right? And they're people who aren't tech savvy or don't need the latest technology, and this is burdensome to those consumers, you know. And and yeah, no, not really the it, And you're absolutely, it's absolutely discriminatory over folks, senior citizens, who very much. They don't have a smart, a lot of them don't have a smartphone. A lot of them are afraid to install any app on it because of the data that and information that they take. They're not as web savvy. And quite frankly, they can't see as well and everything's so small on it. They like a printed ticket in their hand. And especially folks who are international visitors want that ticket in hand. So that, so the apps are I mean, the non-transferable mobile tickets hurt everyone. And, and I'll share with you, even the bigger primary companies that have their own resale agree with this from a business point of view because some of them do not allow mobile apps from competing primaries to resell tickets on their site. And let me ask you about transferability because I'm curious to hear, you know, you know, and I know the the big tour that this is going on right now is first we had the the issue with the black keys a couple months back, but right now there's also a lot of uh, this is in the news a lot with Pearl Jam, um, and you know, was it Colorado and New York allow transferability? So those are the only two markets that um, 
you know, whether you can find Pearl Jam tickets on the secondary market. Um, I am sympathetic to Pearl Jam's argument because, I mean, because they have a track record of trying to be um, as fan friendly and as make sure that they are getting the tickets right into their biggest fans' hands as anybody's been. But I'm kind of curious, you know, what are, you, what are some of the unintended consequences of something like this? You know, and, and, and I, I mean, I know some of them, but I'm, I'm curious what you, you're going to say. All right. Well, first, six states have some type of ban on non-transferable tickets. Connecticut is probably the leading state in the country that has it, and they have it in a much stronger wording than any other countries. Basically, Connecticut's law says once you buy a ticket, it's your property. You can transfer it to whoever you want, and you don't have to go through the venue for uh, transferring the tickets. So there are a lot of venues that violated Connecticut law, and it's not the ticketer that's responsible, it's those vendors. And it doesn't matter what state the venue's in, all that matters is they sold it to Connecticut residents. Now we've seen New Jersey just put up a bill uh, barring the restricted transfer, uh, Boston, uh, I mean, Massachusetts put up a bill, excuse me, Rhode Island put up a bill that's going to ban the transfer as well and, and, and be as restrictive uh, as Connecticut as far as what the venues can do. But if you go back a, a number of years in time, you could remember promoters at trade shows saying that they want their tickets to be just like airline tickets. Now, the question to ask any of these primary vendors ticketing vendors and people want non-transferable tickets. Are you happy with the way the airlines have non-transferable tickets? You can't use those flights when you want it if an emergency comes up. And this non-transferable is really onerous on people in the emergency services sector. So if you're a police officer, a fireman, a nurse, a doctor involved in health care, you're the person who's most likely going to not be going to an event because of an emergency to protect human lives, and you're penalized from it as well. The next thing is folks on top of the transferability of their ticket, not being able to transfer it, are having issues where they can't go not only to lose the ticket price, but they can't use the hotel room. Hotel rooms will usually switch the name for you. So it's, it's usually not a problem, but when it's non-transferable and you can't go, your friends can't go, it's hard to switch the name on the hotel. Uh, and you have the airline problem too. So it compounds the cost for consumers. And you also have the Supreme Court in the, I think it's the ninth district or fourth district rule against, uh, the restriction of personal property in the Lexmark case to say, look, regardless of what you say, that ticket or that product is yours. You can do what you want to it. Now, one of the big issues that legislators are concerned about is what's next that you can't transfer or that you can't sell. Can you have restrictions on your car? Okay. Are there going to be restrictions that you can't sell tickets for less than face value? Which we even seen Ed Sheridan do that in the UK, and his fans were really upset that they could not sell their tickets for less than face value because Ed Sheridan said, no, I have my own tickets left. I don't want you to resell them. So it's really all about money, and also that consolidates a lot of power into, let's say, a large primary that would, would control 80% of the ticket market. It's an enormous amount of power. And they can use that because they compete with their own vendors that promote shows. And they have all this information that can help them market the product at such a lower amount that they don't necessarily have it to give it to other folks. But there's a lot of issues with ticket uh, transferability. And also with Pearl Jam is, the Pearl Jam situation is very unique in that Pearl Jam is actively participating in the secondary market in their European tour. 
marking tickets up to 295 on there. Now, for some reason, they only did it on the U.S. tour, and they were also featured in a promotion in, I believe, June of this year with Ticketmaster on the legislative process uh, on it. And I also believe that Pearl Jam did participate in um, selling tickets through VIP packages, which are basically brokering their own tickets on their last tour. So I really don't know how genuine Pearl Jam's complaint is. But I'd say this, the ticket transfer issue hurts smaller artists, it hurts smaller musicians, stuff like that, and it's very segmented in the music industry, meaning that sports teams uh, who generally have a better practice than uh, a lot of um, musical artists as far as how they sell their tickets. But sports teams are exempt from a lot of those rules with their contracts from primary ticketers, meaning that they can do whatever they want for the tickets. Family shows can't. So why is there this big exclusion on concerts? I mean, like you said, follow the money. Always follow the money. Right. And con don't forget, concert artists only have, on average, a really uh, monetization window of one or two years when they're super hot that they can do something. Yeah. Before that, they'll complain, oh, I want my tickets transferable for everything. But when they're super hot, they won't. And there's a lot of issues with artists charging like a thousand or or fifteen hundred or even two thousand dollars. Elton John was charging, I think, close to three thousand dollars for some of his tickets being and some of those tickets were non transferable. Those folks realize they can't sell them, okay? Or if they sell them, uh they have to give somebody access to their mobile phone and bring in their mobile phone. So, you know, it, it, it's really an issue that doesn't have to be there. And again, this issue is angering legislators who are now starting to look in a lot deeper on a lot more of the practices, especially when they don't think that the primary ticketers are being honest with them in an under oath hearing. Yeah. And, and to go back to something you said before, so like something with Elton John, right? Like, so if Elton John is charging and he can get the market will bear $2,000 for somebody to buy a ticket from Elton John, God bless him. Right. But the, the, the big problem is I think a lot of these acts that aren't as um, famous as Pearl Jam or Elton John or the who um, they're, they're the ones that in my reading of the market who are really suffering because a lot of times they get forced into venues that maybe they aren't ready to play. And so then the, the fans have a bad experience. The band has a bad experience and they have no way of building an audience. And, you know, and I think that to me seems like sometimes one of the unintended consequences of these things. You know, I think that's a great point, especially with the, 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 the smaller artists. So the, the smaller, the smaller artists aren't able to cut a deal with a large primary. In fact, the CEO of the large primary was talking in an investment interview of the way that they can negotiate, that they get a percentage of the service fee, and some of the service fee goes back to the venue, which may technically be illegal in New York. And But a smaller artist can't do it. But now you take that smaller artist, um, oh, even the smaller artists, uh, I'm sorry, even the smaller artists should be entitled to sell their tickets any way they want. What's the difference that a musical artist can do it, but a family show can't, a sports team can't, another genre of entertainment, any other of genre of entertainment is basically able to say to that primary um, that venue with that primary ticketer that they can do sell their tickets any way they want. So a smaller artist who wants to put out a ticket for twenty five dollars at a venue is going to have to have the uh, is going to have their fans pay an onerous service charge from the primary venue, which could be more than fifty percent of the ticket. So that revenue isn't going to the artist; it's going to the primary ticketer, which is which really hurts. 
small and upcoming artists. You know, one of the other problems that we have, with, with, you know, with this, look, some artists are saying, just what's the most I can get for my ticket in my venue? Now, that's great. That's what America's about. We're all about capitalism. But when they say, we're going to do this in a venue, especially in a venue that you consumers paid for, okay, why can't you consumers, if you can't use the tickets, resell them, okay? And, and, and it's kind of interesting that the, one of the states that passed the transferability law was, uh, I believe it was in Maryland, where the actual legislator bought a package ticket for $400 and said, no, you can't buy the ticket, you can't use it, you can't refund it, okay, or you can't transfer it. And that was actually, uh, it really stunned the legislator, because you remember the saying, the only way we use this is for super low price tickets, which is not the case. Everybody wants to own their own property on this. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough argument to make to a normal consumer that if I've spent my money on something, right, and it goes back to if you bought an ebook, right, that I don't own this thing, right? That's a, tough for people to understand, and I think it's almost it's it's a burden on consumers that if they can't like if I buy you know I buy an ebook, I can't just do anything with the ebook. It's the same thing with the ticket in a lot of cases. If I buy the ticket. I should in some way be able to get rid of it if I can't use it or if I don't want to use it anymore or something comes up or whatever happens. I bought it. It's mine. I should be able to get do something with it. I mean, that's that's what a lot of this comes down to. And I think, at least in my point of view, the, one of the big issues that comes up is that there's too much cons, uh, too large a consolidation of power into too few hands. And, um, you know, and, and that was really one – that's really one of the – challenges I think consumers are dealing with here. Yes, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, there, there are plenty of example, examples of venues that have multiple distribution channels. And even if you look at event producers and some venues, they're saying, okay, you know what, if you're going to sell tickets for, le for less than face value, we'll, we will allow you to do that if you do it through us in the primary ticketer so they can each gain a share of that money when you're losing money on an event. You're discounting your tickets because you can't sell them. And then on top of that, you have to pay more money to do it. Venues should be able, at, at least state-sponsored venues, should be able to distribute the tickets wherever you want. No one should have total control of that venue. It's a public venue. It's a public's right. There was legislation uh, offered to be proposed to restrict that in in at least one state, but the legislators backed off on it because they didn't want to dictate business to publicly owned venues. But I see that uh, I see this ticket market as starting to fragment. And if it does fragment like that, that is the best thing in the world for event producers. They can discuss which primaries they want to deal with. They can list primary tickets on the secondary, which is becoming more and more common. And what they can do is they can control the service charges, make them lower, and, and everybody can win. But the main thing is consumers have to win. It's not us, it's consumers. If consumers win, everyone's happy. If consumers don't win, and if consumers feel like they're getting ripped off, okay, that's a problem for everyone in the industry. And again, this problem in Congress, I wouldn't call it a problem, but, but these issues are starting more issues. And I think you're going to see venue finance be a big issue before the end of this year. Well, you're already seeing it if you look at the stuff that's going on in Florida right now, where, you know, there's a lot of different... Um, arguments being made about not financing or publicly financing stadiums in Florida. And I think that's just going to expand uh, because like you said, the consumers are getting, they're, they're not being treated with the respect that they deserve. And I think, um, you know, you see it because I forget what the number is, but ha you know, more than half the tickets don't get sold every year. Right. I think in the hearing, it came out that two uh, sixty 60 or 70% of the of the events they don't sell out right um 
you know, you all you got to do is follow on Twitter for a, for a few minutes and see empty seats galore um, to see that like consumers and fans and customers they're all turning their back on on, on these things, and that the just these like few high um, value events are really holding the whole thing together. And so if you don't get back into the business of serving customers and generating demand, I think you're going to have a, a, a situation where a lot of things are not, are not going to be sustainable. I, I agree. I, I, if, if, the, if the marketplace is the way it is and continues to be this way um, without some changes, the consumer backlash will grow. The consumer backlash against artists will will grow as well. And one of the things that's really helping that uh, consumer backlash is some of the transfer, uh, the transparency of the media bringing these issues to light. Because there's always an unspoken word in the press that covers the music industry. It's always known that if you go and expose these issues of what our artist does, not only will you not get an interview with that artist, you will not get an interview with any of the other artists you represent. So you're not going to get, you're not going to report that story. And they usually don't. They usually cover it up in some way or they don't, uh, they don't address it. Like the biggest thing they really didn't address is they, the amount of tickets the main reason why consumers don't have access to all the tickets is because of all of the massive holdbacks. And it's mainly on concerts. Let's be fair. Sports really tells folks, hey, we only have this many tickets available, and they don't do the holdbacks. In fact, the NFL came out, I think, three years ago, say, well, three or four years ago in a case in Philadelphia saying, yes, we do not sell any Super Bowl tickets to the public at all. You know what I mean? So I think a lot of things are changing. And I think consumers, especially in the sports world, are figuring out that their season tickets, at least in the major league level, aren't worth as nearly what they're paying. It's more economically efficient for them to buy single games. And while a sing, you know, what I like to say is a, a season ticket account used to be a badge that you're someone special that you bought a season ticket account is now sort of like you're a little bit foolish because of two things. One, you're paying more for the ticket. And the second thing is if the team goes good, either they're going to raise the price. And if you resell your ticket and they don't like it for some reason, you get sick or you can't go and you start reselling the ticket, they might not want you to have those season tickets anymore. So there's a lot of bad policies with season tickets that are hurting the uh, hurting the season ticket marketplace, and that trend is continuing. A lot, a lot of short-term thinking is happening, and it's um, eventually it's like a fever. Uh, hopefully, it's going to break um, because you know I, right. I think you can't continue. You can, you, you have a job, right? Your your job, any of us in business, my business, is to create and keep customers. Don, your business is to create and keep customers. You can't keep dumping customers left and right because you think you're going to find a new one because none of these places, none of these you know venues, none of these towns are big enough to just, you know, piss off everybody. It's just not, it's not feasible. Yeah. You know, I think, I think the biggest takeaway for, from this whole conversation is, well, one, this issue is not only going to affect the folks that were up there um, testifying in front of uh, Congress. Okay, it is going to affect them in each, in many, in different ways, especially where um, some legislators, legislative aides, felt like the folks were misleading in their answers or, or, or somehow obscuring the facts. It's, it's going to hurt them right. a little bit worse than everybody else. It's also going to help. It's also going to hurt a lot of or change the business for a lot of smaller ticketers or smaller primaries who could use this to their advantage, but they have to get involved. I think it's for the artist community that supposedly represents artists to get together and say, you know what? It's really unfair that 
musicians and concert artists are discriminated against with their ability to resell tickets, while other genres of entertainment aren't discriminated against. So, the, you know, various states have employment discrimination acts, and you never know if you're going to see an attorney general in one state say, you know what, I don't care, you're discriminating against them because of their employment status, which which may be which which may be illegal, okay? And so there's a lot of issues that that may come out with this, uh, and, and you never know. There could be FTC action before this congressional action. The FTC was very clear about the display of service fees. I know that we complied. I know that uh, a few other folks complied, but I know that the, the larger sites have not complied with their wishes. And, and they gave a really easy wish to start the ball rolling. And, you know, I respect uh, the commissioner that she gave enough guidance for ticketers to be more transparent about their service fees. But, again, if this, if this doesn't move the right way and people get the freedom to transfer, you're going to see more things mandated by the federal government, which is their obligation. They don't want to get involved with the free market, but if they feel consumers are abused, they will get involved. Yeah, that's exactly Dave, right. Dave, thank you, thank you so much for the time to be in your pod in this call. I, I appreciate it. Don, thank you so much. Uh, I one thing before you go, I want to highlight uh, your donation uh, of service fees to support the charities uh, to match Rage Against the Machine. I, I know I pointed it out a couple times. Uh, I wanted to point it out here because I thought it was super, super cool. Um, so good on you for for doing that as well. Oh, thank you very much. Right. No, we would take it. Look, if they're going to donate the money, we'll donate the money. And, and you know, we, we, we generally have that offer out there where anybody's doing a charity event where all the money gets raised to a nonprofit, we'll – We'll put that in as well to the nonprofit as long as they're doing all the money. And uh, we want to contribute to that cause, but we still want to service consumers and folks who want to go to that event. Yeah, no, I, I think thank it's you, a really nice, uh, nice thing. So, Don, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. What did you think of my conversation with Don Vaccaro? Let me know. Send me an email. It is my name, Dave, at DaveWakeman.com. You can visit my website. It's DaveWakeman.com where you can find my blog. You can find uh, resources. You can find all kinds of great stuff. So check out my website. I'd also love it if you connect with me on social media. You can find me on LinkedIn. Just search my name, Dave Wakeman, or you can follow me on the tweeters. That's at David Wakeman where for now, whatever, 100 and something episodes I've been saying, if you know the person who has the at Dave Wakeman Twitter handle, get it for me. The guy hasn't tweeted since 2010. It's a decade. I need that Twitter handle to keep me on brand everywhere I am. As always, I would love it if you like the podcast and you find something valuable, if you would share it with your friends, your coworkers, and your colleagues. Pass a link along. Maybe it's this episode with Don Vaccaro. Could have been the previous one with Gary Adler. It could be some of the early ones with like my good friend Lauren Teague, where she talked about being the first director of... Uh, social media and the PGA Tour. Um, could be some of the things with like um, my friend Kat Spencer or Simon Mann from Booking Protect. Um, could be any of the episodes with Eric Fuller uh, talking about the secondary market. Um, Brett Zelaski. Um, Aubrey Bergauer. That was a fantastic one recently. You know, So share any of those. If you've already been sharing the podcast, I'd love it if you would do me a favor. Click the subscribe button. <laughs> We're on all the major podcast platforms now. And if you've subscribed, I'd love it if you'd rate and review the podcast. It helps encourage me. It helps let me know what I'm doing right or wrong. And it helps people discover the podcast. So it would be great. I'd also like to remind you to check out my newsletter, Talking Tickets. It's once a week on Fridays. It goes out usually in the middle of the night here on the east coast of the U.S. Five top stories, a quick analysis, some action items about it so that you can 
take action, not be surprised by something, or you can think about something differently, you can get that one of two ways. You can send me an email, dave at davewakeman.com. Put talking tickets in the subject line, and I'll get you added to the list. Or you can go to my website, that's davewakeman.com, and you can click on the talking tickets link, and it'll take you to the sign-up page. As always, I want to thank my friends at Booking Protect for being my partner in the Business of Fun podcast and being my partner in so many things. Um, as I mentioned at the start, we are promoting a ticket guide program right now, which is going to be really, really cool. It is a brand new program where we are looking for folks who love live events. So, And I'm assuming if you're listening to this podcast, that includes all of you. But love theater, love concerts, love sports, comedy, what have you. And you are willing to share your thoughts, your ideas, your experiences with us, our audience, and across social media. I'm going to include the link to the application in the show notes. But go to the Booking Protect website and search for Ticket Guides or follow me on the LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, we will get that link out to you. Um, it's going to be a great program. It's going to be an awesome opportunity to see some new events, maybe some new venues, um, and share your experiences and your ideas with a global audience of folks. It's really, really fun. Uh, so go to bookingprotect.com, check that out. And while you're there, check out how you can become a Booking Protect partner because they deliver the best customer service of any refund protection product anywhere in the world. Um, They give your customers peace of mind. Um, Think about what's going on in the world right now. Uh, Having a little peace of mind on your purchase is probably well worth the cost. And for you, it's a brand new stream of revenue. So check them out, bookingprotect.com. As always, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being here. Um, I couldn't do it without you. Until I talk to you again, take it easy.